Welcome back. Let's continue on our journey. I've got a, a couple additional questions. We're going to go through these extra ones that have sort of been hanging chads <laughs> that got asked after I had done the videos. Here's a question about game studios. What are some things developers and particularly small studios can do to create a genuinely happy and healthy working environment? Are there any things which tend to get commonly overlooked that lead to toxicity, but are actually easy to avoid or mitigate if they're considered in advance? You need to have a company culture in place. And that company culture has to be something that is lived and breathed by the entire studio. Because when you have a company culture, and what I mean by company culture is like a set of principles or guiding ideas that, that everyone adheres to in terms of how they do things. Uh, and for a studio, those things are like, let's have fun making games together and let's monetize ethically. Let's be open, honest, and transparent with our community, for example. When you have those principles in place and every new person who comes in sort of is given these as a guideline and asked to make sure that they adhere to them in their, in, throughout their, their workplace, then everyone's sort of on the same page. And when someone deviates, when they're not open, honest, and transparent, or when they start doing unethical things in d system design or monetization, or if they start upending tables and being a toxic piece of shit, you're not having fun making a game, are you? So it's very important to have those principles in place and for every new person who comes into the company to know about them and make sure that every once in a while, at, at any annual party, for example, or any sort of get together, to restate those principles and make sure that you're still adhering to them and that it is still the guiding light for the company. Sometimes they need to be updated. Uh, sometimes a company deviates from them in such a way that they can no longer uphold one of their key principles. For example, Google used to have the, the guiding principle of do no evil, and now they are evil. So one of the key ways to avoid a toxic work environment is to make sure that everyone sort of understands that it is a collaborative workplace. And that's something that is hard for certain people to grasp because the moment that they feel that their position is threatened, they will look for ways to attack other people to bring them down. For example, in a collaborative work environment, uh, a lead designer might be very accepting of new ideas and go, ah, oh, that's, that's a very interesting idea. Let's build on that idea and see if it can work for the game. They might not always accept the idea, but at least they entertain the thought of it and sort of walk through why it works or doesn't work for their game or the creative vision or whatever the case may be. In a more toxic work environment, that lead designer might reject it outright or say, no, we're not accepting any ideas at this time. Or, you know what, I don't got time for this. Like, those are the sorts of things that will create enmity between uh, people and toxicity around the work environment. Because if people feel like they're not being heard as part of the creative process, they're gonna break down and things will become very rapidly unfun for everybody. Which is why one of the core principles of a game studio should be about having a happy and collaborative work environment. Now, it's also easy for new people to feel like they aren't being heard and then to lash out. And this is something that I had to work on uh, relatively early on in my, as a game designer, where I was being heard, but we just didn't have time for some of the things that I was talking about. In other situations, I was being ignored. You know, I wasn't totally wrong, but there were a few issues where I, I could have done better. And that's one of the things that is hard for people to see when they're new. And it takes a very strong mentor uh, to sort of walk them through what's going on. It's like, yeah, your idea is good, but for this game, the vision is about X, Y, and Z. And we only have N number of months to get this done. Save it, you know? I think that there's a potential future for that idea, but it's just not in this game, I'm sorry. And that tends to calm a lot of people down. There are also people who are suffering through Dunning-Kruger, which is that they think that they know this much, but they actually only know about this much, then they can't recognize people who have a lot more experience than them warning them about things. And that's one of the reasons that I went into freelancing was that I would often be hired to be that person to come in and go, hey, you got some problems here. And because I was coming in from outside the company in a position of authority over certain elements, people were more accepting in general of my feedback. And I told, I would always say like, you can always ignore me if you like, but it's at your own peril and you're paying me for my time anyways, so it's up to you. And that tended to get them to listen more because there's this feeling, if it's someone within the company who are, who's going, hey, you're kind of going down the wrong direction here, it tends to be more personal and 
feel like an attack and like, oh, are they trying to oust me from the company? And that's where all the corporate politics comes in. And then you see things like people lashing out or looking for ways to undermine other people and playing mind games and that kind of shit. I just have zero tolerance for that anymore. I will not work at a company where I see a, a lot of politics going on. It's just too frustrating. Game development questions. Question 25. How come mainstream AAA modern video games have veered away from being more simplistic, tactical, methodical, strategic, and steady paced when it comes to gameplay, challenge, and difficulty, and instead have become overly complex, very fast paced, chaotic, and emphasizing hair trigger reflexes? Oh boy. I call this trend chasing. What happened with the mainstream AAA is that they were chasing a trend of people liking FPS games. Sort of sparked by Counter-Strike, I would say. And then you saw it proliferate throughout everything, Call of Duty. But basically, FPS became sort of the focus. And so everything focused on that because that's what made money. And then it became a self-perpetuating cycle where you need to have these FPS elements in order for it to be a competitive game in the marketplace. And there you have it. Everything became FPS games as a service for a long time. In terms of more simplistic and tactical games, look for hyper casual games on mobile and you will see very, very simplistic games of every genre. I encourage you right now, go to the Play Store on your phone and just look up your favorite genre and I guarantee you will find a ton of super simplified games in that genre. The only issue is that most of them are monetized like a mf -er and uh, might be painful. Question 26. Why do so many mainstream AAA modern games and game franchises emphasize the player being at a disadvantage at first and having to struggle to get better rather than being strong and powerful right off the bat and having mastery to take on the long and hard challenge they have to accomplish? It's more fun. And also there's less of a learning curve. So generally speaking, it's just a progression thing. So if you feel like your game needs progression, then you have to start the character off somewhat weak and then build them up over time by giving them stuff. It is definitely the mainstream thing to do. It does work and it is having an RPG element without having to do all the trappings of an RPG with levels and things like that. Though a lot of them do add levels and skill trees and things. Question 27. When it comes to gameplay balance in video games, why do so many current developers studios resort to making a broken game mechanic weaker, aka nerfing, rather than introduce a new game mechanic that's just as powerful and can counter the broken game mechanic? Generally speaking, it's because the broken game mechanic works in so many different situations that introducing a counter to it would not fix the majority of the situations. So say in a RTS where you have four incongruent sides, race A has some sort of broken early game unit that dominates all the other three. To counter it, you would have to build three more units, one for each team. Instead, you just nerf the one that's the problem. So it's the tallest grass gets mowed. It, it actually it makes sense to do so. It's not like laziness or anything like that. It's simply if something's so far out of whack that it's causing problems across the board, you nerf the thing that's causing the problems across the board, not create something for everyone else to counter it. <clears throat> because it's just way more work. Question 28. How come you see more video game developers, especially AAA ones, making games that are hyper competitive, insanely hard to master, frustrating, boring, repetitive, convoluted, and unfair? Do we see that? <laughs> Rather than focus on making games that are fun, hilarious, cool, awesome, interesting, captivating, unique, and most important of all, enjoyable. Okay. What you're really asking is why are AAA games always on that hyper competitive games as a service kind of cycle? And the answer to that is simply that games as a service makes more money, period. Every time. You've seen God of War came out and it was really good and well received. It made $500 million over its current lifespan. $500 million. Compare it to, say, any games as a service. Le League of Legends makes a billion dollars every year. Every year it makes a billion dollars. So what are these big AAA game studios going to do with, with, with all that money? They're not going to make God of War. <laughs> Um, unless it's a passion project. And that's where you'll see like things like The Last of Us and God of War. Those were passion projects from somebody. And that's why they stand out in a, a sea of games as a service. I have a whole diatribe on games as a service. I think it was part of my 2019 review of the game industry, which I haven't done the 2022 one or the 2021 one. Maybe I'll revisit games as a service and, and the problems there. Question number 29. Why did so many entertainment mediums often choose to adopt hyper photorealistic, muddy, faded, grayed out, washed out, foggy, gritty, depressing, sometimes ugly colors and aesthetics during the 2000s, rather than the more colorful, beautiful, powerful, saturated, blah, 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 blah of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2010s. It was uh, realism. Uh, everything was moving towards photorealism. Every 
new graphics card update. It was how f how photorealistic, how close to the real world can we get with this newest uh, iteration. With ray tracing, that's another step in that direction. Well, NVIDIA provided the ray tracing. Now all these studios want to use it to make things look more and more realistic. I don't think that there's any particular reason that they should do that. There are still games that focus on uh, other aspects, but what's in the mainstream is photorealism and looking as realistic as possible. How realistic do the graphics look now? How close are we to the real world? When, when can we jack into the matrix and lose ourselves in, in a fake earth? Those things are coming and uh, that's just the direction that things go as technology moves forward. You wanna see how close you get to reality. Question number 30. Why do so many games, especially RPG and FPS games nowadays, rely on restrictive class systems rather than implementing a freeform classless system? Yeah, so what happened was the paradigm of the tank healer DPS sort of got locked into the brains of all systems designers or class designers, and everyone's sort of built from that since then. Um, and because of that, they relied on that class system in order for any raid encounter to work. So it's sort of proliferated across the MMORPG genre, and then it sort of slipped into all RPGs for some reason. But there are still a few that work on off-skill-based systems. Wasteland, for example, and uh, Fallout to some degree, they don't use classes. I don't know why Mass Effect used a class system. That seems like a mistake to me. I think people are coming around to the idea that we don't need to have the tank healer DPS, but we'll see. There's a new crop of MMORPGs coming out. Maybe some of them will break from the, the standard. Let's hope so, because I definitely prefer either skill-based or like loose class systems where there are ways for like even a, a rogue element to do cool stuff. Those are all the extraneous questions. Thank you for joining me on this journey through the questions and answers for the Ask Dave Anything series. Uh, if you have any more questions, please come to my Discord server and feel free to ask me. Uh, I'll probably just answer them in the chat because most of them are not. Don't take that long. So thanks for joining me. Good morning. And if I don't see you later, good afternoon, good evening. And